paralysis by analysis and quarterback blasphemy and where do you draw the line in the sand this is the college game day podcast we are recording on wednesday april 3rd it's an nfl draft version Reese Davis, Pete Thamel, and the great NFL draft expert, Matt Miller, with whom I will be spending some quality time in Detroit coming up in just a few weeks, uh, here to talk a little bit about the draft. And as the saying goes, when you think we're talking too much about quarterbacks, let's talk some more about the quarterbacks. And there, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of um, uh subterfuge out there there are red herrings being drawn there's uh people there are people misleading each other and the thing that pete has teased me about matt that we'll start with um because i have been really high on drake may and caleb williams too for that matter for for quite some time but especially drake may the drake may blasphemy is starting to bother me i mean it's it's bothering Defend his me. honor reese <laughs> it's bothering me to the point of uh, I I want to be rational. If he needs to work on his footwork, go ahead. I get that. He missed he missed some throws that you know should have been right on one shoulder, one on the right one. This pet. I got all that. But he is the quintessential guy, in my judgment, who is being picked to absolute pieces. And whoever passes on him is going to regret it. Tell me I'm wrong. I don't know that you're wrong, Reese. I it's this time of year is you know, it's terrible for, for folks like myself and for my children who like to eat and go to school and things like that. It's great that the draft is at the end of April, but really the draft could probably be at the end of March or we would all be OK. You know, we would get through pro days and just have the dang thing. We'd probably all be better served because some of the silly season that happens would would be you know much quieter. And, and what's funny about this is and we all know this, haven't done this for a long time. We're going to be in Detroit to be April 25th. And Drake May could be the number two overall pick in the draft and all the talk for the past two months about, oh, he, you know, he had five misses at his pro day or here comes J.J. McCarthy or here comes Bo Nix. All that talk could go away instantly. You know, the Washington Commanders could take Drake May at number two overall and the months of talk are, are gone and no one really remembers them after that fact. And so that that will be the fascinating part. You know, I like Drake. I, he's my number nine overall player in this class. He's my number three quarterback. He has been my number three quarterback, I think, since October. You know, he's he's been right there. So I haven't seen anything from probably Halloween until now that says, oh, my gosh, let me bail on this player. Now, I am a little bit lower on him than some of our colleagues at ESPN. But it, we're still talking about a top 10 pick. We're talking about a player that should very much be in the conversation at number two overall and number three overall. I think where we can get into the weeds on all these guys is, what team is best set up for Drake May to have success early on? What system does he best fit into? Because like every player, he has strengths, he has weaknesses, he has areas we want to see him improve. We could say that about Caleb Williams. We could say that about Jaden Daniels. And so I, I think what happens, unfortunately, is you start talking about, I like to see the footwork get cleaned up. Or, you know, there are some decision-making things that I wonder about with Drake May. And those become these big you know, negative aspects to his game when really they're just things that are question marks or things that you would like to see get worked on. So uh, your seven round mock and God bless you for doing that. How long does that take? Yeah, not as long as you would think. I'm almost afraid to say because I don't know if people will believe me. I, I would need to get the wonderful Ben Arledge, my editor, to back me up. The making the picks, guys, took three hours. And that is a testament to being very organized. And you guys both know me. I, like I, I am a very organized individual. That is how I can do the picks in three hours. The thing that gets you is you're in round three and you forget Cole Bishop and you got to start the whole dang thing over. You know, or you're in you're in round four and the Chiefs trade Legarius Sneed, and so you've got to go through it. Okay, how, what is this change? What type of impact does that have? Because you know, Pete, you you write a lot. You hand things in about a week before anybody sees them sometimes, and so you're praying for a week that nothing changes that, that you have to go in and fix. So it's, it is a long process, but it's fun. I love, I, I know, you know, I talk to guys like Daniel Jeremiah, Mel Kuyper, you know, the great people we work with Jordan Reed, Field Yates. Some people love mock drafts. Some people hate mock drafts. I love mock drafts. Like I would do one today if they wanted me to do one. I think it's so much fun to explore how teams can get better 
the domino effect, but seven rounds. I'm only, I'm glad we only do one of those a year. All right. That's, that's, uh, that's fair. Uh, so Reese's man crush on Drake may has been a, a constant podcast theme. The other interest in Drake may comes from uh two-year-old Teddy Thamel because Teddy Thamel's Patriots need a quarterback here in Boston. And you have the Patriots trading out of that position, which I'm sure from like a football standpoint, makes a lot of sense. But like, come on, man, can't the Patriots take a quarterback? Like, we've had enough. We've had enough post Brady. Like, what? What do you think? They, sometimes I feel like in the mock draft industry, like sometimes these things emerge, and it's clearly the Vikings want to move up and take a guy. But like, what do, is that? I guess. What do you think the chances are of that happening? Is that mock theoretical, or is that is that a real is is that a real thing we could see at three? Because Teddy wants a quarterback. I, yeah, I, I think both. Teddy will get a quarterback within the next two years. So I'll say that. Uh, I, I think it's both. Pete. It is. Some of it is a mock draft a month before you are running scenarios of let me do something different. And and like you said, we're recording on Wednesday. Our, our buddy Field Yates had a mock draft come out with like six trades in it. Some of that is you want to show what could happen if this does happen, but you try to tie that to reality. Like the New England Patriots with a new regime looking at this roster and saying, if we draft Drake May at three, Connor McDermott is our left tackle right now. And Kendrick Bourne is our number one receiver. This is maybe not the best environment for a rookie quarterback, regardless of who it is, whether it's Drake or Jane Daniels or JJ McCarthy, it is not the best environment for a rookie quarterback. So I think that was something I wanted to explore with that trade of, we know the Minnesota Vikings are going to be aggressive. They have pick 11, they have pick 23, they have a second round pick, they have future first round picks. They're going to be aggressive. So what does this look like for both teams? And what does it especially look like for New England from a team building standpoint, if you're able to get the the three first round picks instead of using one on a quarterback for a roster that's maybe not quite ready for him? And I know the, the pushback will be figure out the hard part first, which is the quarterback. Get the quarterback first, then worry about the other positions. I I am I hear that. I'm on board with that, generally speaking. I think for New England, it's it's at least worth exploring the scenario of. What if they don't? What if they don't take the quarterback early and try to find, you know, a left tackle and a wide receiver as an example? So I'm going to blame you in Detroit if they trade the pick. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. That's okay. As we were sitting in the draft last year, the rumors started to fly. Will Levis is going to go number four. And then Will Levis was sitting there until Friday night. Compare and contrast the J.J. McCarthy buzz with the Will Levis Uh, talk from a year ago yeah I I mean it's very similar and it's not just you know it wasn't just Will Levis before that it was Malik Willis before that it was Mason Rudolph you know I mean I've been doing this since 2011 it feels like there's a guy every year where where he was supposed to be the the first rounder that doesn't happen I think the difference for me this year would be the amount of teams that have backed themselves into that corner at quarterback Uh, let's talk about Denver Denver has the number 12 pick in this year's draft They do not have a second round choice because they traded it to get Sean Payton. Denver in a market where think of all the quarterback movement we had this year, the entire 2021 quarterback class got traded. Basically Uh, same 2020, almost that entire quarterback class was traded. All these teams are adding new quarterbacks, except the Denver Broncos. They are rolling right now with Jarrett Stidham and Ben DiNucci. No disrespect to either guy. But they have not made an addition. They didn't get in the Sam Howell market. They didn't get in the Kenny Pickett market. They didn't get in the Justin Fields market. So I look at Denver and say, maybe J.J. McCarthy doesn't go top five. Maybe the New York Giants even say, we added Drew Locke. The last time Daniel Jones was healthy, we made the playoffs. We're, We're good at quarterback. Let's say that happens. I cannot see a world in which J.J. McCarthy gets past the Denver Broncos at 12. Just by virtue of what they haven't done, in this off season. So I think 12 is a floor for JJ and the ceiling might be two. It it might be a two to 12 uh, wait for him, but I can't see a scenario where he doesn't get past 12, especially with Sean Payton is going to coach you very hard. The stories of him telling players, listen, the team, the people that own this team own Walmart. If it doesn't work for you, you can go be a cashier. You know, we have jobs for you. He's going to coach you pretty hard. JJ having been with Jim, Harbaugh can handle that. I think the personalities work very well together. And then I maybe I'm reading the tea leaves too much, but Denver's inactivity tells me they'll take a quarterback if one's there at 12. I want to see Sean Payton meditating 
by the goalpost with JJ before the before the game starts. I really, I really like Jay. Are there any concerns? I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, Michael Penix, his age, surgeries, the different things. JJ's had some shoulder issues. They're in the past. He revamped his throwing motion, as I recall, with Tom House. It's been a few years ago, but he took an off season. I think it was the year he was competing with Cade McNamara for the starting job at Michigan, which would have been what twenty one, I guess. Um, these these pro these teams go deep when they are there any uh, are there any concerns about that when you also combine it with you know I wondered as it turns out I guess he wasn't but I wondered when Michigan was reluctant to throw the ball at all for the second half of the Penn State game and you could argue that was protecting him from being hit you know by Chop Robinson over and over again but um, there was a stretch where they didn't throw it as much and it made you wonder a little bit is he okay. Um, are there any concerns about that digging way back into his history? You know, I'll, I'll say this, whether it be on JJ or anyone else, I have not yet heard any leaks from the combine medicals. Uh, the, the combine rechecks happen April 11th, which is exactly two weeks before the first round of the NFL draft, which is pretty close to the wire. But, uh, you know, whether it be JJ or Penix or Peyton Wilson, those that medical information has been kept fairly quiet so far this year. We'll see if that changes within the next you know couple of weeks here. But uh, I think that is something that teams will do their diligence on that, and it may be something where you're getting poked and prodded at the combine, and they say, "Oh wait, this here's something with the shoulder," and let's dive in deeper. To that maybe there's a blip that shows up on an MRI, and they say, "What's going on with the shoulder?" Generally speaking, uh, for folks who don't follow the draft quite as as you know closely as the rest of us, it's a pass fail with your medicals. And it's now seen as, will you make it out of your rookie contract, which is four or five years? Will you make it out of that? If so, you're usually giving a passing grade. So it, it is something that will have to be checked. And if I remember right, JJ had a little bit of an ankle this year, too, that got tweaked, I, I think. And that was that's something that, you know, you, that's going to get looked at as well. Uh, having watched him throw, I, I was fortunate enough to be at the Michigan Pro Day. He has changed a lot about his throwing motion over the past two years. He's changed up his footwork. I think there were a lot of times, if you go back and watch the combine throwing workout, he's really struggling going to his left. Like he's just, he's overstepping at times. The ball's coming out uh, awkwardly, leaving to some inaccuracy. At his pro day, there was this emphasis on throwing to his left and throwing with more touch and timing. And it it did look better. So you can tell that they've made a a really a concentrated effort to clean up some of those mechanical issues. And that does go to your point, Reese. Let's clean up the motion a little bit, take some of the stress off that shoulder and I, I do think it's been a net positive. It's led to better touch, but that is something that will get looked at just as much as Michael Penix's, you know, two right ACLs and the two shoulder injuries and all that. It will absolutely be. These guys are going back to junior high to find injuries. They're going back to high school to watch tape. They're going to find it. If you've been hurt, they're going to find it. You know, it's, and I do want to point out and emphasize that I'm not suggesting that he, he was hurt. I'm just saying that, it was something I wondered. I remembered the story about the rest that they gave him, but he he throws the ball uh, beautifully. He made, I mean, everybody knows about the Ohio State throw where he said he'd seen on tape that the guy, you know, when the guy turned his back, it was over. He wasn't going to look back. There was also a throw, or actually two of them. One of them was a touchdown. One was just a completion in the Nebraska game of all games this year that he made, and I was like, Man, that is an NFL throw, both of them. I so I have no doubt that he's going to be good, and I think uh, I, I think the Denver idea is tremendous. And if he goes two overall, I he could have success anywhere. I think, but the Denver idea is compelling at twelve, and it feels about right uh, for him, at least in my judgment. But we'll see. But you're the draft expert, so you you get to opine on that more than I do about where where they should fall exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, on my rankings, he's 19, you know, but w- this happens every year. A player is ranked in the teens and goes in the in the single digits in the top 10, Pete. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, you know, the quarterback markets are are fascinating now to where you're you're almost overdrafted or or not in the first round. You know, it, 10 years ago, we would see two or three guys drafted in the top in the first round, and now it's a race to get five or six in there every year, it feels like. You mentioned being at Michigan Pro Day. What kind of spectacle was that? I mean, 18 Michigan players. I'm sure there was a few other local guys who uh, who rolled in. 150 
uh, NFL scouts, executives, uh, et cetera. Just set the, set the scene for us. Uh, most of our listeners have never been to a pro day. That thing had to be it been like a mosh pit, right? You know, shockingly, Michigan has an enormous facility, so it wasn't crowded, which is, you know, they, they have a beautiful facility. So you walk into the, you know, the the indoor uh, facility, and which is nicer than, you know, most colleges where I'm from. And you, you go to the weight room, which is the largest in college football, dedicated, you know, purely to the football program. You do the agilities and the strength workout there. And, and then you roll out to the field. And it was it was so organized where they did have, I think, 21 players participating. And it was it was three hours. We were in and out very quickly. And so they did a great job of, you know, you're running 40s. Let's get those over with uh, when 40s are over. OK, if you're doing short shuttle, here's where you go. If you're doing three cone, this is where you go. You know, if you're doing vertical or broad jump, here's where you're at. So they did a great job of running that that event and making it really, really seamless. And then, you know, to, to close it out with a, about a 30 minute throwing session from J.J., uh, to different, you know, Blake Corum was hyper involved in the the route running, which he made a point to say he wanted to show his versatility, not just running routes out of the backfield, but also flexing out. Uh, we got to see, you know, Roman Wilson and Mike Sanger still return punts. So it was it really well organized. You know, they've they've had a lot of pro days there. I've never heard guys of 150 NFL personnel being at a pro day. Texas had 96 a couple of days before that. And I thought 96, that's that's got to be a record. And then we get to Michigan two days later and there's 150. So it just, it goes to show the talent they had there, the way they've developed it. And, you know, quarterbacks drive the pro days. You know, that's why we go to Ohio state and it's a smaller turnout. You go to Michigan, huge turnout. It's all about the quarterbacks. So next year, I think we should all be bracing for the Colorado Buffaloes pro day. It's going to be a big one uh, with the, because of Shador Sanders and, and Travis Hunter. So we, I'll see you guys in, in Boulder. I'm sure game day will be there covering it live. We had a good time in Boulder this year. We had a, a great time. It was a great scene. Uh, they need to they need to get back to that early season type of success so we can we can go back. Yeah. The Rock was there. I'm sure you were. I'm sure you were watching, Matt, when the Rock came in. I watch weekly just so I could text Thamel and, and mess with him about what what's <laughs> happening on game day. So. Or, or do you mess with him about whether the tie is askew or not? Oh, I got enough tie feedback. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so, always askew. It, it, I should be messing with when it's when it's straight. <laughs> you know, you said you did a seven round mock draft. Uh, Pete and I did a a podcast. We actually recorded it earlier today on the NCAA tournament. Have you seen this great left tackle prospect out of North Carolina State, DJ Burns? He's he's got the size of a he's got the size of a dump truck and the feet of Michael Jackson or Baryshnikov from Nureyev or Fred Astaire, if you're really old, he can dance on a light bulb and not break it. And yet he's enormous. I mean, I think he's going to try hoops. But if he were to throw his hat in the ring here at the end, would he get drafted? Oh, I think so. He's listed at 6'9", but I don't think – I've never seen him in person. That's what I would say, 6'7", 285. Please give this man to Jeff Stoutland and let him become a left tackle in the NFL. And, and I think you can even look at someone like Jordan Mulata, who is the Eagles left tackle and, you know, who didn't play football, but now is one of the better left tackles in the game. So uh, I was listening to a podcast recently and Lane Johnson said, you know, basketball agility and pass pro agility are, are very, very similar. And that, it, you know, it kind of gives you that mental picture, which helps me a lot of like visualizing things like, oh, wow, it really is. You know, if you can slide defensively, you can slide and mirror a pass rusher. It's, you know, length is important. Timing is important. So, uh, yeah, if DJ wants to, to try for football, I, I would love to be at that workout. But I, I do think, you know, we all text with scouts and they're, we're all watching the same things at night. And they're, man, this guy kind of looks like a left tackle. I've had some people say defensive tackle. I think he's a little tall for that. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to lose leverage pretty quickly at six foot seven and a half. But I would love to see him, you know, try for an offensive tackle. And and I'm not a hoops scout. It's not – I'm not NBA draft scout. But uh, I watching him play, that was my first thought was, this guy looks like an offensive tackle to me. Let's start it. Let's go. So if he held a workout in the week after the Final Four, do you think every team would go? Yes. Yeah, I do. I mean, it would be very well represented. You know, get him a workout in Charlotte. And yeah, I think every NFL team would would be represented there. It would be smart on his part. Why not leverage, you know, yourself? You've got all this hype right now. Your name's never been hotter. And, you know, there 
this is also not an improbable pathway. This isn't like us talking about, you know, could Zion be a, a tight end one in the NFL? Like there is, you know, there's some precedent here of guys going from the tournament to have really good NFL careers when basketball is not, you know, when you're not going to be a first round pick in the NBA, why not give it a try and see, see what the market is. I, I think he'll still, and I haven't spoken to him about this. I'm not sure anyone has, but I still think he'll give basketball a go, you know, for a little while longer, but this is always, this is a good alternative. You mentioned the scouts talking to each other and you're, you're an independent thinking guy. I've enjoyed getting to know you over the last few years. How do you avoid in the scouting world? How do you avoid group think or being, or maybe even uh, apart from that, being afraid that the other guy if especially if there's more than one other guy who thinks something that maybe you weren't quite on board with being afraid that what if they're right what am i missing how how do you approach that yeah it's tough i think you know one thing that helped me very early in my career when i was at, at bleacher report and no one really bleacher report was just a you know starting out and I really jumped on the table for Alshon Jeffrey as my top receiver in the 2012 NFL draft. And I got told by everyone with a social media account that I was wrong, that I was an idiot. He goes to the second round and becomes a really, really good player. So I think at that point, I was naive enough that having some success, being an outlier, made it to where I wasn't so much afraid of it. I, I think also it helps we, if you're going to be different from everyone else, have good reasons, you know, have context to it of, you know, even a historical precedent. Here's maybe what scares me about this player. Or, you know, here are some of my concerns. You know, I, I had a second round grade on Patrick Mahomes because I thought I've never seen anyone have success playing like this before. Now, obviously, you realize how wrong we all were and he has had success. So I think it's learning when something is an outlier that you want to support and also saying, OK, that's an outlier that I'm worried about, whether it be size or lack of speed or lack of production. Um, that is the biggest thing for me. And as much as I respect and will always, you know, revere Mel Kuyper, I try not to consume a lot of his content because I don't want that in the back of my head. Same for, you know, Daniel Jeremiah, NFL Network, or the you know, Field Yates, Jordan Reed. You try not to consume a lot of their content because you just, you don't want that in the back of your head when it's time to, you know, draw your line in the sand on a player and say, here's where I have them ranked. But, you know, it's, it is a, a very, you know, we're all very much alone at times. The NFL teams have, you know, 20 scouts that work together and they debate all these players. Those of us in the media, uh, you're a, a one person scouting department a lot of the time. So that does help in some ways. Of we're not jumping on calls every morning debating these prospects, you know, to where you might move a guy up, move a guy down based on those conversations. And, and we're talking to NFL scouts. It's more of like a, a good natured ribbing of each other of like, you really have that guy that high? Like, what are you seeing that I'm not, you know, and, and there's some good back and forth. And then every now and then you have to also admit like, okay, you got me, you were right about that one. Uh, but it's more of like a camaraderie than it is. You're trying to, to win each other over to your side of thinking. Who are you just the most wrong on? I, I know who mine is and I, I will tell you after that, but who, who were you just like, hey, I was dead wrong on this guy. I mean, Mahomes, obviously, but also I would like to say, if you weren't wrong on Patrick Mahomes, you probably deserve some type of special award if you saw that coming. Uh, Trent Richardson is my go-to answer on that. I thought Trent Richardson coming out of Alabama was, you know, the next great NFL running back. And he had, you know, he had a productive rookie season. When the Indianapolis Colts traded for him after his rookie season and they paired him with Andrew Luck, they had my number one and number two overall players from those draft classes together. I remember sending a tweet like the you know the Colts are going to win a Super Bowl with this duo and they were you know both out of the league but you know before that tweet even had a little dust on it so it was cuz they didn't have a good kicker that's exactly what it was yeah if if the punt game had been better uh or the kicking game had been better uh no I mean that's that's the one and and you also learn you know not to compare guys to Hall of Famers you know I I early in my career you would watch guys like oh they're shades of you know, Peyton Manning here, or there's shades of Aaron Rodgers there. Like, no, let's not do that anymore. You know, let's just try to be honest about the comparisons. And you can say like, oh, this arm talent is on par with Josh Allen, or, you know, this player speed is on par with, you know, Chris Johnson at running back. But I think, you know, the longer you're in this business, the more you learn how to articulate your thoughts and not everything has to be crazy hyperbole. I was dead wrong on Josh Allen. 
Like I thought Josh, I was dumbfounded that like he wasn't accurate in college. So there's, it was a very simple thesis. If you are not accurate in the Mountain West playing Utah State and New Mexico, you are not going to all of a sudden become accurate enough against the Patriots, Dolphins, and Jets. Like, it just, like, it made no sense to me. Now, the physical skill was undeniable, and there were flashes and moments, but I was like, I I said no thanks on on, on Josh Allen. I am reminded about that by our uh, friend Mike Tannenbaum, who, uh, who who heard my conviction and now, and now chuckles at it. But boy, boy, that was a massive whiff. You know, and, and Mike, I went to, to Iowa and watched him play. I think it was week one that year. And I, I had written an article saying Josh would have been a top three pick had he come out the year before. And he didn't. And, and you know, goes back to Wyoming. So I go to Iowa. Like, we're going to watch him play a power five team. We're going to see what he's got. I think he threw four interceptions that day. He threw a ball down the middle and missed a guy so badly, he might have split the uprights. Uh, throw, <laughs> yeah. he, he basically, just, I mean, I remember that and, game distinctly. Yeah. And Josh is an example of, you know, watching a guy get better through the process. You watched him at Wyoming. And then I remember being with him at the senior bowl and watching him throw and thinking, well, that looks different. You know, that's very different than what I saw at Wyoming. Then we get to the combine and he looked like a completely different guy, mechanically speaking, you know, he had cleaned it all up. And, you know, the, that first, I think the first two years in Buffalo, there were bumps and bruises. There's still times Josh, let's go the ball and you wonder where it's going, but he has really found consistency, which has you know, allowed him to become a great quarterback. And that's, it is a lesson in self scouting about all these guys of, you know, it's, it's so much of step one in scouting is what can they do? I think step two is where can they get, what can they become with good coaching, with work ethic, with, you know, a lot of time spent on their own trying to become better players. And that's why it's a, a really, really difficult job because those, those last two things are, so much it's on the player and on the situation they get drafted into. Who would you jump on the table for this draft? Doesn't have to be a first rounder. Doesn't even have to be a quarterback that not many are jumping on the table for, but it could be your, your Alshon Jeffrey or those who jumped on the table for Josh Allen saying he would be accurate. Who's your guy that you're predicting this year? Yeah, man, there's a lot this year. Uh, I think because we've spent so much time talking about the quarterbacks this year that, like, we forget about the other players. So I would jump on the table for Quinion Mitchell, the corner from Toledo, every day. Uh, I would – Roma Dunze. It, I just love Roma Dunze as a human being and as how driven he is to be great. And so I think that's where those two players, I've seen their work ethic. I've seen their drive and their want to be great. And those are paired with really fantastic physical attributes and – really fantastic production. So you feel a little bit better about it. You know, Quinion Mitchell, he had four interceptions in a game against Northern Illinois. He ran two back for touchdowns and you're watching this on tape. And you're like, can he do this against, you know, power five guys? And then he goes to the senior bowl, you know, a fast forward a year later, goes to the senior bowl and he races everyone at the line of scrimmage. Then he goes to the combine and runs a four, three, three hangs out and does 20 reps at two twenty five on the bench. And you're just you're like, you fall in love with that. You know, of a guy who's just, willing to check every box and doesn't shy away from competition. And then, you know, the great Roma Dunze story of he's hanging out after workouts, trying to run a better three cone drill. And it just shows you how much these guys want to be great. And, you know, those are both players to be drafted in the first round. I'm not trying to, to say to anyone, these are my, you know, round three sleepers that are going to become all pros or anything. But in the, in the first round, those are two guys. If, if I were running a front office, I would want those types of players on my team. Can I give you my one NFL draft guarantee? Yes. The Chargers pick uh, Mikey Sainer still from Michigan. At some point, yeah. Probably I, yeah. a little higher than they, like he'll go because he's, he's short, right? There's some paradigm things there. And if not, the Ravens take him despite the Chargers. Like that is that is something I have conviction on. If that, if that guy is not on one of those two teams, I will be I will be dumbfounded because he's been a podcast don't rule favorite. Don't Seattle. Don't rule out Seattle. Mike that's McDonald true. is the head coach that's of Seattle. True. There's a lot of Michigan ties in the NFL now. That's that's very true. I, I'll give it a – he has a three te- – there are three teams he can go to, and that's it. Uh, because he's been a podcast favorite for those who those who've listened. I know Reese has had that. That's been Reese's like defensive man crush. Is that a fair assessment, Reese? Yes. Yeah. Big fan. He and actually a guy who will be highly thought of next year. He and Will Johnson, both the same still and Will Johnson. Um, both that would be hilarious to me if McDonald took took him from both Harbaugh's. Well, he took Harbaugh's son on staff. Or if can like Kansas City should draft Mikey at sixty four. You know, just 
replace Legereus Sneed with Sandra Steele. You've got, you know, kind of rubbing it into Jim Harbaugh. I did, I talked to Sandra Steele at, at Pro Day and he, we did a great interview. He was fantastic. And he said, said you know, when I'm done playing ball, I'm going to come work with you. I was like, yeah, that sounds great. He, he definitely had the, the personality to do it. So, uh, you know, in 10 years or 12 years, he might be, he might be doing this podcast with you guys instead of me. Well, I was, he wants to, he wants to be in broadcasting or he wants to be a draft expert uh specifically what does he what does he want i wants to be in broadcasting specifically he's he's too he would be too good at my job i'm trying to steer all these nfl players away from once they realize they can come talk about draft prospects it's over for me so let's put them on nfl live and college game day and those shows we don't we don't want those guys doing the draft yeah that's that that's why that's why you can't ever let uh, you can't ever let anybody Wally pip you. You know you got to you got to get out there and hold that spot because sooner or later in our business, all of us get dragged out boots first. We all know that, you know. So you know, you have to hold on for as long as you can before the Sainer stills come and get you. You know, so. yeah, pride of Everett. He could come. Uh, he could come to the podcast, right? You know, it's like seven miles from my house. But so. maybe maybe we'll have him on as a as a guest since he has been a, a podcast favorite. Yeah, well, no, I, I think, think we had him on leading up. He could just break down the Michigan right. players, and that would be a whole draft. <laughs> yeah. That would be that would be two hours. Just yeah, that right. There. <laughs> what what is what is going to be the biggest surprise in this draft? What? Give me a little prediction here before we before we yeah. let you run and continue continue on with your mocking. Yeah, I think the biggest surprise will be where our guy JJ McCarthy goes, and I, I, you know, I've heard all the narratives about you know, like we talked about. It, it feels like in this industry to raise one player, another has to drop, which is unfortunate because I, I don't think it actually works that way. But I, I wouldn't be shocked if we're sitting in Detroit and JJ McCarthy is the second or third quarterback off the board. I, I watched Cliff Kingsbury spend about 25 minutes with John Beck before JJ McCarthy's throwing session. And you, a lot of times, let's not read in too much to things sometimes, uh, but other times it is appropriate. And, you know, Cliff spending 25 minutes with, the private quarterback coach of J.J. McCarthy felt it felt notable, you know? And so there's, I, I think it's something let's, let's see what happens. It's been interesting to watch the J.J. McCarthy rise. I also, I, I also understand I'm going to speak out of both sides of my mouth here. This could be the greatest smoke screen effort ever by Jim Harbaugh to get four quarterbacks in the top four so that he can draft Marvin Harrison Jr. or Joe Alt at number five. Maybe Jim is just pushing the best non quarterbacks down to number five, right? But I, I, I think the, the big story, you know, as, as you know, we will be watching on, on Thursday night will be, you know, J.J. McCarthy. Is the, has the, the pre-draft rise, is it real or has it been manufactured? People think that we root for outcomes in broadcasting. What we root for, storylines. And if something like that were to happen, uh, our draft coverage on ABC, which will have a wonderful vignette on JJ and the guy that he is off the field, and then the discussion that that would spawn. Um, I don't wish ill on anyone, anyone's draft stock to fall as a result, but that would be fun to talk about on Thursday night if that were to happen. Especially because you have the guy who JJ just beat in the Rose Bowl sitting next to you on the desk. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, I, nobody's nobody's seen more of him than Nick. Yeah, and you know the thing, Nick. Uh, Nick is uh, uh, speaking of guys who are locked in. Nick has been asking, "Hey, where can I get some more tape on these guys?" <laughs> so he, he's like digging in, man. He's like, <laughs> "I'll send, I'll send you my address to give to him if he wants to come watch tape together. I'll pull, I'll add an extra chair. I'm, I'm grinding through day three guys right now. I bet he would love that. So. He would love that, absolutely, yeah, for sure. Matt, a pleasure, man. I look forward to seeing you in Detroit. Likewise, thanks so much, guys. you have any big prediction before we uh, wrap this draft episode of the podcast up? So I think we're going to get six quarterbacks in the first round. I've said it since the senior bowl. I think Michael Penix ends up at the end of first round. Uh, Matt had him, uh, I think 47th. I just saw in to going to the giants in that. I just think if the, the thesis also Reese is that next year will not be a deep quarterback class. There's a couple guys who were who are promising Shador, Carson, Beck, Quinn Ewers, but there we're not going to have five or six. And so the NFL does not view the 2025 quarterback crop near the same as that. So if you need somebody, 
And I think those guys all go pretty high. You may, you may just say, you know what, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take Michael Penix late in the first round. So that, that's my, I think we go six. We have a night. We, we party like it's 1983. And almost all of those do. In fact, all of them did well. I mean, uh, Ledge had some unfortunate circumstances at that, that time, but all of those quarterbacks did well. Perhaps all of them will uh, this time as well. Pete, a lot of fun, man. Look forward to uh, talking again in the days leading up to the NFL draft. Once we get past uh, the NCAA tournament, we will primarily be focused on the draft and then with a little touch of spring football here and there. Oh, you're, you're, going, you're going to enjoy this. Sorry, I'll leave you with this one. On, on football and spring football, one little deal. So I was a, a guest on a radio show in Tuscaloosa uh, yesterday, and the guy says to me, you know, people are so crazy over this Final Four trip that hardly anyone is paying attention to spring football at Alabama. And my response was, that might really work out quite well for Kalen DeBoer in his, in his first spring. So, but... But our eyes will be on some spring football. We'll talk about that in future podcasts in addition to leading up to the NFL draft. We appreciate you listening. Encourage you to subscribe to our podcast or download it wherever you prefer to get your podcast.